Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name's Ben Wilting and I'm with the Amarillo Public Library. This is part two of our 13 part series designed to help you obtain citizenship in the United States. Today, we will be covering the first 11 civics questions. All of today's questions deal with U.S. geography and national monuments. Stay tuned. Part of what defines a country is its geography. In questions 1 through 11, we will be discussing the geography and national landmarks of the United States. Before we get started, I'll just let everybody know that the questions we'll be using are found on our Amarillo Public Library website, the Citizenship Resources. I'll have a link to that in the description below. Those are all the same questions that you can find on the USCIS website. Um, they're just in a little bit of a different order, so that makes it easier for us to cover them and teach them in these sessions. So, the same questions, um, just in a different order and that's on the APL website. So let's get started. Question one, name one state that borders Canada. We've got several choices here, Maine, North Dakota, New Hampshire, Montana, Vermont, Idaho, New York, Washington, Pennsylvania, Alaska, Ohio, Michigan, and Minnesota. If one of those has some sort of special significance to you, I would suggest you use that one. If all of these are the same, then I would suggest New York. It is quite possibly one of the most famous states in the United States. It can also be used as an answer for some more questions on your civics, uh, the civics portion of your test. So New York would be my suggestion for uh, what state is the easiest to remember on this list. It's worth noting that any of the questions that ask for one answer, uh, it's very important that you only give them one answer. The reason for this is if you try to impress your interviewer and rattle off four or five answers, um, if you get one of those wrong, then you've got the question wrong. Um, they can mark the entire question wrong if you answer one wrong answer and four right answers. So just pick one that you know you can remember, and when you're in your interview and you get asked the question, just give that one answer. Question two. Name one state that borders Mexico. California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Again, if one of these sticks out to you, or if you are like me and live in one of these states, Texas, you can very easily remember at least one of these answers. If you don't live in one of those states, or they're all pretty difficult to remember for you, or they're all the same, um, I just pick the one that, that jumps out the most and make sure that when you're studying, you give that answer. New Mexico is an easy choice. Mexico is right next to New Mexico. California is also a po uh, popular state. So any of those four are fine. Just make sure that you study one and when you're doing your interview that you give one answer. Number three, what ocean is on the east coast of the United States? The east coast ocean would be the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean. What ocean is on the west coast of the United States? The Pacific Ocean. Very important that when you hear this question, you do pause and think about it. 
This is a question that's very easy, but people tend to miss it because they rush. They hear what ocean is on the, and they say their favorite ocean. Um, sometimes that's not the answer they're looking for. So make sure you listen to the question before you start to give the answer. The fifth question. Name one of the two longest rivers in the United States. The Missouri or Mississippi River. You can say either the Missouri River or the Mississippi River. Whichever one is easier to remember, study that one. What is the capital of the United States? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is nowhere near uh, Washington State. Washington State is on the west coast, and Washington, D.C. is on the east coast. Don't get those confused. Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C. sits right between Maryland and Virginia. It doesn't officially belong to either of those states. It's a district unto itself. Um, the D.C. stands for District of Columbia. The reason they did this is they didn't want any uh, state, I guess, to have the capital located within it. Um, so they made it its own little district. And here's a lovely picture of Washington, D.C. Number seven. Where is the Statue of Liberty? There's several answers you can give for this one. You can say New York. You can say New York Harbor, you can say Liberty Island, they will also accept New Jersey, near New York, or on the Hudson River. Any of those answers should be acceptable. Uh, the reason why there's so many um, answers is because the Statue of Liberty is actually inside the border of New Jersey, but it is built on land that is owned by New York. So a little interesting piece of history there. A little bit of history about Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the Statue of Liberty became a symbol for many immigrants entering the country early 1900s, the first place a lot of immigrants who were coming into the country would stop is Ellis Island, where they would be processed. And Ellis Island is right down the river from the Statue of Liberty. For, so for many of the immigrants coming into the country, the first thing they would see in America is the Statue of Liberty. So it became a great symbol of immigration from the country. So now we're going to talk a little bit about U.S. territories before we continue to number eight. A U.S. territory is an area that is overseen by the government, but it's not a state. They have their own laws and governing um, bodies. However, they do not have the same rights um, as a state. So they're similar to a state. The U.S. government oversees them, um, controls them, but they do not have all the rights that a state would have. So number eight is name one U.S. territory. We have five choices. <clears throat> Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, and Guam. 
again, like the states, um, just pick the one that you find to be the easiest to remember. If you are a Spanish speaker, that might be Puerto Rico. Um, otherwise, you know, whichever one just jumps out at you as being easy to remember, jot that one down. And when you practice your questions, just make sure that you're practicing um, that particular one over and over again. Uh, remember, you only have to give one of these. So don't study all of them and then get confused on your test. Make sure you have at least one of these uh, down so that you can give it as your answer. Number nine. Here we see the American flag. The question is, why does the flag have 50 stars? Why does the flag have 50 stars? The reason for this is there are uh, there is one star for each state. We have 50 states, therefore there are 50 stars on the flag. Um, you can say one star for every state. You can say there are 50 states. You can say each star represents a state. Number 10. Why does the flag have 13 stripes? The answer, there were 13 original colonies. Each one of these stripes represents an original colony. You can say there were 13 original colonies. You can say one stripe for each original colony. Either answer works. Number 11, what do we show loyalty to when we say the Pledge of Allegiance? When we say the Pledge of Allegiance, we're showing loyalty to the United States. Um, you can say the United States or the flag, which represents the United States. The proper protocol to saying the Pledge of Allegiance is to turn to the flag. If you have a hat on, you'll remove it. Um, and then you put your right hand across your body, over your heart, and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for joining us. That was part two. Join us next time in part three, where we'll cover civics questions 12 to 25. See you next time.